Lindsay Lohan? And no. Uh, her, her her dog is going to be put down tomorrow. Oh, Jeez. God. It's full of Not up to Okay. Recording in progress. So I believe it's 7 o'clock, and I'm going to call the uh, special select board meeting of Tuesday, January 3rd to order. And the first item is approval of the agenda. Moved. Second. Moved and seconded. Are there any uh, requested changes uh, to the agenda? Anything you know of, Kathleen? No. Okay, hearing none, all in favor of approving the agenda as drafted, signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Next is approval of the consent agenda. I move to approve the consent agenda as presented. Second. Moved and seconded. Is there anything in the consent agenda that anybody would like to discuss? I just had one comment on the... Um the second page of the Addison County Regional Planning Commission letter of the grant, the municipal roles and budgeting adequate staff, municipal planning commission, other municipal board time over a two year period. Just pointing what, what, out what, the vacancy. Is that what you're doing? Nope, no, no, nope. This is about the grant, the for transportation trans oriented in, grant. Yeah. Oh, the Northwestern Vermont yeah. Todd grant. The TOD plan for, yeah. um, I just would make that comment. Okay. Um, I will point out that there is a letter of support for Velco's application to expand Torrey Road substation in, in this approval. And uh, if there's anything else, if there's not, hearing none, all in favor of approving the consent agenda as presented, signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Okay. Citizen comments. Is there anybody here for something? Yes. Even Laura. Hello, friends. Um, I am Laura Asermoli, and I want to thank you for your careful work on the budget and and support of our various committees. And I want to emphasize that the climate got my attention mm. um, and, and that we are in climate emergency and that everything that we do needs to consider that. So I know that we're going to be hearing other reports tonight and I'm paying attention from that filter. And I encourage you and hope that you are too. We are in climate emergency, a very serious one. And we saw that last week. you, Heather. Is there anybody else who's that's here? Laura. 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 Uh, Laura. <laughs> yeah. It's okay. Where did Heather come from? I'm right here. Yeah, looking uh -huh. at you, talking to uh, any, anybody else for something that's not on there. Okay. Uh, then we're going to move on to continued review of the draft uh, FY24 general budget, and I'll turn it over to Kathleen. Okay. I am. Um, uh, sad to report that I don't have any big reveal of major budget savings or um, money falling from trees to help us out with that. Um, but I am uh, happy to call up the budget. And um, if you have had any thoughts uh, to share about it, um, happy to answer any questions you have. Um, or perhaps we should go into Fred uh, and uh, Kurt's presentations on the budget, on their budget request. Uh, Fred Kinney from ACEDC uh, is. Good thing I got first. first. <laughs> <laughs> it's Guys, unusual. Move right along. Good evening. I'm Fred Kenny, Executive Director of the Addison County Economic Development Corporation. Um, on behalf of the uh, ACEDC Board and our membership, I want to thank 
the select board and voters of Middlebury for your continued support of ACEDC uh, over the years. Um, your support helps us maintain our operations, but also, I think more importantly, helps us to do our work to advance economic and community development in the region. Um, we are requesting an amount that's consistent, I think, the same amount we've requested for at least the past 10 years, and that's a $7,000 uh, municipal contribution. So I appreciate the opportunity to be with, be with you tonight and uh, do a presentation on ACEDC. So I thought I'd provide a, a brief overview of ACEDC, who we are, what we do, what, what is a regional development corporation a little bit. I then give a brief, st brief summary of our staffing and our budget <clears throat> and end with some highlights of our activity uh, and impact in FY22, uh, which for us is July of 21 through June of 22. Um, I've just distributed a FY22 impact report that we did this year, um, and I encourage you to go to our uh, website and look at our new interactive impact map. Um, shows all the projects we were involved in in FY22, and I want to give kudos to um, ACRPC, the Regional Planning Commission, for their help on the, creating that uh, interactive map. Um, I think the link was given to you with the materials that I sent in for tonight. So ACEDC is one of 12 regional development corporations in Vermont. Um, RDCs are independent, nonprofit economic development organizations uh, that are overseen by boards. Each RDC started locally um, at different times for different reasons and developed organically to address um, unique economic conditions in each region. So some of the RDCs cover a larger region, like up in the Northeast Kingdom, there's one RDC for three counties. Uh, Springfield has one just for Springfield, but here in Addison County, ours covers the, the county. There's others like that, like Rutland's a county-based one. Um, so we each operate um, a little differently. But we each get a state performance grant, and for that grant, um, we serve as the coordinators of economic and community development in each region. Sort of the eyes and the ears, hands and feet of on the ground to implement state and regional economic and community development goals. Our state agreement um, requires and ensures that we consistently deliver certain services in each region. Um, such as business development and recruitment, uh, direct one-on-one -on -one assistance to businesses and entrepreneurs, project development services, including relocation and expansion, direct services to businesses, um, and referral when needed to services and programs at the regional or state or federal level, um, business education and training, and collaboration and coordination with local, regional, state, and federal partners to help advance underlying economic development goals, such as workforce development, worker housing, early childhood education and care, and broadband. So on these issues, we may not be the lead, but we partner with the lead on those broader economic development issues. Um, so because with, to fulfill our state grant, those are the kind of the things we have to do. We all do it to our best ability with the staff and funding that we have. Um, so we serve as a one-stop shop for economic development and business services. If we don't have or offer what a business needs, um, we make sure they get connected to the right person, program, or service. So that's a lot of what I do is spend time with businesses, understanding what they need, um, what their growth path is, uh, what they need to be successful, and then connect them, either provide the service they need or connect them to a service. Um, some RDCs have additional services. Um, for example, several of us operate revolving loan funds. We have one. Um, and some own and rent property. Uh, we do not, we are not a property owner at this time. But some own quite a bit of property and make quite a bit of 
money doing that. <laughs> Uh, you know, they may rent, they rent it out to businesses. They may have a business incubator as part of that, but like Brattleboro, Burlington, a few others own, own property. Um, for staffing and budget, we have 2.75 staff. We have two full-time, myself, the executive director, and we also have a full-time um, grant and um, uh, project manager, and then a three-quarter time office manager. Um, so everything I mentioned, we do with that staff. Um, our budget is just under about 300,000 a year. Um, the revenue sources for that budget are our state grant, which is about 40% of the budget. <clears throat> we get 20% from other grants that we apply for, uh, and doing grant administration fees from that. About 19% is from services such as our evolving loan fund. We make a little off the interest from that. 15% um, comes from member dues, um, business members, and about 6% comes from municipal contributions. We have about 10 municipalities that contribute to us. The expense categories are um, payroll and related, payroll related, um, which is our biggest category, of course, that's 68% of the budget. 17% for professional services like an accountant, marketing communications, and uh, our annual audit. Um, about 4% for insurance, 3% for rent, and about 8% for other expenses. Um, so a little bit about some highlights from fiscal 22. Um, during that fiscal year, we made about 111 business visits with different businesses around Addison County. We held 11 events um, that had uh, about 240 participants. Most of those were um, remote, they were web-based, like we did eight business education webinars in partnership with the Chamber. Those were all online webinars. We plan to partner again with the Chamber this upcoming year, and we hope to put in some live, live uh, seminars along with the webinars. But, uh, we hope to do about 8 to 12 more webinars this year. We also did three workforce development events last year. Um, we did a job fair with the Department of Labor and a bunch of other partners. And we did a financial reality fair at the Hannaford Career Center for um, high school teens to learn about budgeting and uh, what it means to put together a budget and, you know, figure out how you want to live and then how to pay for it. That was kind of fun. Um, we, uh, we applied for directly or assisted with grant and loan applications that totaled about uh, $1.8 million in FY22. Uh, those include, included a $500,000 loan from USDA to recapitalize our revolving loan fund so we can make more loans to businesses in Addison County. Um, we got a $30,000 grant from USDA Rural Development to conduct a feasibility study um, for the potential eco-global project that we hope will occur here in Middlebury. Uh, we got, helped get two Vermont training program grants totaling $37,000 for two Middlebury businesses. Um, we got two, we applied for and received two um, building community grants from BGS, Buildings and General Services, totaling $35,000. Uh, we helped get uh, 16 SBA technical assistance grants that totaled $64,000 for 16 um, small businesses here in Addison County. Also through a partnership with Efficiency Vermont, um, we brought uh, 100, about $172,000 to Addison County businesses for um, 13 energy efficiency and renewable energy investments by those businesses. Um, we also administered a $30,000 grant for a regional tourism marketing initiative that was in, that's ongoing. It's in partnership with the Addison County Chamber and our three downtown organizations. Um, we hired a firm and we did uh, summer, fall, and winter. We're in the middle of the winter um, campaign right now to hopefully bring tourists here from the Boston, New York, and Albany drive markets. Um, that's been a really great project. That was a grant from the state. Um, 
In partnership with the Regional Planning Commission, uh, we applied for and got a $500,000 grant to fund uh, and uh, to assess Brownfields projects. Uh, we're working on that together, but the Planning Commission's, you know, leading it. Um, also, in, in partnership with the Hannaford Career Center and Collins Aerospace, uh, we received an earmark of $100,000 for a workforce development project uh, that's being developed right now uh, with the Career Center in Collins that'll uh, give students that go through the program that's designed to leg up uh, to get a job. They'll be prepared to get a job at Collins or other, you know, shops in Madison County that uh, need technicians or, um, uh, you know, line workers. Um, in addition to all that grant assistance, we also made three loans totaling $150,000 for two projects from our revolving loan fund. Um, we are still ongoing partnering with the Regional Planning Commission to create a comprehensive economic development strategy. That's pretty much wrapped up. We'll be submitting that to EDA in the next couple of months. And then Adam and I will work to kind of, that's a four region comprehensive economic development strategy, Chittenden, Addison, Rutland, and Central Vermont. So we're gonna take the work from that and develop a regional economic development strategy for just Addison County that will build on the local municipal plans and it will also complement the larger region plan that was hopefully will get approved by EDA. And both of those, the, especially the SEDS, will um, in the future bring EDA funding to Addison County. Um, also, we partner with the Hannaford Career Center, Middlebury College, and many others to, um, on the Makery Steering Committee. Uh, we participate in that. And uh, we convene the Addison, an, an Addison County Partners Group. That's a group of um, regional organizations um, just to get together and coordinate and collaborate and make sure we're not stepping on each other's toes. And, you know, we try to work everybody towards the keep everybody growing the same way <laughs> in Addison County. And we also convene the Addison County Workforce Alliance. Um, in, uh, in partnership with the Regional Planning Commission again, we annually create a regional priority project list. We just wrapped up the newest one and we'll be submitting that to the Agency of Commerce in January. They use that to score uh, projects against state funding and they also give it to their federal partners like the uh, Northern Borders Regional Commission, and they use it to score their, their applications as well. That's a way of them knowing what are the priorities for Addison County. They get one from every county. Um, so we've got, I think, 13 projects submitted to that uh, this year, and we, we submit our top 10. So that's in the, in, uh, the prioritization process right now. Um, let's see. We also have assisted uh, about a dozen applicants to the new Community Recovery and Revitalization Program. Uh, four of those are from Middlebury. Um, so hopefully those will, some of those will be successful. Uh, we've also assisted Summit Housing with several issues uh, as they've making their way through their process and uh, we continue to work with Eco Global and Dubois Dairy on their potential Middlebury projects. They're both in the phase of seeking capital right now, so that's why you haven't heard from them for a little while, but hopefully they're successful in finding capital for their projects and then they'll be back and they'll start the permitting process and uh, hopefully get those projects underway. <coughs> so that's a little bit of what we've been doing over the past year. Looking forward, um, our priorities are, again, to move the Dubois and Eco Global projects along, get those moving along, uh, continue to work with uh, several projects to identify, apply for, and administer uh, funding resources for projects like Acorn's Food Hub, uh, is the Isley Library expansion, uh, the Summit Housing Project, Town Hall Theater expansion, and the Otter Creek Child Care Center. Uh, just to name a few. So we're working with all of them to help identify potential resources. If they want the help, we'll help them with the applications. Some of them will end up administering the grants. Uh, for example, the Otter Creek uh, Child Care Project and a Porter Project 
that won NBRC funding from last round, um, they chose us a, to administer their grants. So we have we oversight have over we provide oversight of their grants for NBRC, and we get a little fee from that. But, um, also, this upcoming year, we'll be, as I mentioned, finalizing the SEDS and developing a regional economic development strategy, uh, hopefully advancing workforce development projects like the one that we got funding from Senator Leahy for and others, um, doing work to help strengthen the entrepreneurial ecosystem in Addison County. I met with uh, Matt Dunn from Cory, uh, and hopefully we're going to be joining, get, make, taking part in the programs that they offer to work on you know the gig economy and entrepreneurial activity in our region and um, a project that I'm initiating this year uh, it'll just get started this year it'll probably be a two or three year project to, before it's accomplished is I'd like to establish a business incubator for Addison County that might include um, services space for office in, office business incubation but also small light industrial business incubation we one thing we lack in addison county is a lot of you know two to six thousand square foot uh, space so we get these great small businesses that are coming out of their garage or graduates from middlebury college and they just can't find space to start their business or grow their business so we'd like to start a incubator space we, we'll apply for funding for it programmatic money and hopefully get that established in the next couple of years um, so that's probably enough. I, but I'm, I'll, work, I'll uh, take questions. <laughs> Any questions of Fred? Fred, is, uh, there's been a lot of money, uh, obviously, slashing in the last couple of years. Do you anticipate that your grant-making uh, ability is going to be constrained uh, coming up? Yeah, I mean, there's still s some... ARPA and federal money coming down, you know, trickling down, sure. um, especially for infrastructure. Mm -hmm. A lot of the um, direct economic development funds have already been dispersed, and yeah, the the, uh, the grant sources will be tighter yeah. in uh, in the upcoming years. But there's like EDA just got another five hundred million dollars nationwide, of course, for infrastructure from the infrastructure bill. Um, and so that's kind of still trickling its way down, and we hopefully will be able to take advantage, get some of that. Um, the money that all went to the state for them to allocate, for the state to allocate, has all been allocated and and dispersed. So we did get some of that. We got um, we helped the state um, with um, uh, to review some of the applications in the early years under Act. The uh, CARES Act, actually. So and we got paid for that. So all the RDCs helped them so that they could get those applications through quickly and get the money out the door. And each RDC that participated was able to make you know, some fees off of that. Um, and then we have two other programs that one of them we designed and presented to the state, and they gave us funds to disperse. That was all for very small businesses to provide technical assistance. Um, so we identified small businesses that needed some kind of technical assistance, like building a website, just for example. And we had then identified 300 Vermont businesses that could provide those that technical assistance, and then we matched them up. Sure. And so that, that was fall of 2020. Um, we got all that money out the door to so we benefit 800 Vermont small businesses benefited from that program between the recipients and the the technical assistance providers and then we then more money came from the SBA to do a similar project so we repeated that because it worked so well so um, none of that went uh, none of the, the SBA money is going directly to us it's going all to the small businesses but uh, we're helping you know direct businesses to that program and 16 businesses in Addison County has, have gotten that technical assistance. So uh, it's been pretty good for the region. But yeah, that going forward, I think there's going to be less money available. Uh, we can help try to get some of that infrastructure money for, you know, municipal infrastructure for the housing project, for example. Um, so we'll be helping identify that and, 
and uh, help ap apply for it if they if the applicants want our help. Great. Any other questions of Fred? We, we have a hand by Judy. Uh, Judy? Are you there, Judy? I'm here. Okay. It's just, can you hear me? Can you see me? And we can you don't have to see me, but you need to hear me. We hear um, so a couple things. I came in, I signed in, I think it was like four minutes late. Community comments or citizens' comments is over. I can get you when we get done with Fred here. I can't hear you, Brian. Uh, we'll come back to you after we're set with Fred. Unless you have a, um, uh, a question for Fred, we'll come back to you for citizens' comments. So to say thank you for approving all the three committee applications, I have to wait and say that later. <laughs> if, 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 if that is all you have to say, Judy, Very clever. I, I think you're done. But <laughs> oh, oh, I'll, I'll wait and say that later. Um, no, you got it. Is, Kathleen, you sent me a message because I raised my hand and said, do you have a question? And there was no way I could respond to you that I did have a question. Okay, you, you don't have and a... About, um, you know, am I too late to present citizens' comments? Okay. So, again, my citizens' comments was thank you very much on behalf of the tree committee for approving all our applications. Um, but I missed the presenter that just now presented because I do have a presenter. I have a question for that person, but I don't, sorry, I apologize, I don't know who that individual is. This is Fred Kinney. He is the Executive Director of the Addison County Economic Development Corporation. Okay, so my question is, because you mentioned infrastructure, uh -huh. what is that group doing as far as implementing green infrastructure strategies, techniques, ideas. Where is the hey, Judy. where is the organization on that particular, that very specific specific um Ju Judy, they're their economic development, not they don't get to actually do the infrastructure design and stuff. Fred helps with with getting grants and aid for that type of activity. That's just one of the many things he's he's doing. So right, but why mention that they are interested in you know improving infrastructure if that's not their deal? I was in. Can you hear me? I think so. Yeah, I was responding to a question about federal funds, and that's a, one of the sources of federal funds that is still going to be available is for infrastructure. And uh, like Brian mentioned, we don't we don't implement infrastructure projects. We help the implementers find funding. And um, you know, there, I mentioned that we would like to start a business incubator in Addison County, which to me is, is business infrastructure. So we would, if we did that, we would, um, we would build it, um, you know, to the best of our ability and funding to, you know, meet green standards. Like, uh, I don't know if we could do it at zero carbon, but we would try to. Um, I also mentioned, um, you might have missed it, but I mentioned that we, uh, partnered with Efficiency Vermont to yeah. to bring um, $172,000 in Efficiency Vermont grants to Addison County that went to businesses that were implementing efficiency energy efficiency projects 
and by purchasing, you know, efficient, um, energy efficient machinery and equipment to make their operations more um, energy efficient. So that's how we get involved in it. And we, and we participate in um, the Addison County um, Climate Economy Organization. And that's for towns and businesses and not local residents. What is? The, the grants that you got. Oh, the grants that we got from Efficiency Vermont, those were grants for businesses. Okay, so they're not interested or not involved with what's going on with local residents. Definitely interested. It's not our it's not something we work on. Why? <laughs> Except to help because our focus is on business growth and business development. Uh, like I said, we participate in the Addison County uh, Climate Economy Action Center, which does, uh, so we help, we're, we've been helping them trying to find funding. And they're involved in, with um, individuals and residents. Not to pursue the point, um, but just a parting comment that I think what happens for local residents would be helpful in terms of the business economy. Totally agree, Thanks. but we have two and a half staff, so we have to kind of focus on what we do. <laughs> and I think it should be in part with, in large part with local residents. Thanks. I'm good. Thanks, Judy. Thanks. Fred, I understand what you're doing, and I appreciate it from my business aspect when I was in, and this is $7,000 that, that is more than multiplied that comes back to the community. It's, an, it's a no-brainer that we're going to approve it, but just want to let you know we appreciate what you do. Thank you. Yeah. We appreciate your support. Thanks, Fred. Kurt, hopefully yours is a little easier here. guarantee it will be shorter. <laughs> uh, I'm Kurt Broderson. I'm the executive director of Middlebury Community Television. Uh, we have a staff of maybe 2.4, two of whom are here tonight. Jim is behind the camera and is the one that you see the most here, although he's hiding behind the computer. Um, our budget's about $150,000 a year. Probably 80 to 85 percent of that is Comcast subscribers. Uh, I found this on the web. That is uh, passed through uh, from subscribers to Comcast to us. Uh, we also subcontract with Ilsley Library for the technology coordinator position, which allows uh, technology programs, filming of library events and talks, um, lots of uh, programs for kids after school or during school vacations uh, through the library. Um, so our annual request has been for $5,000 for the last few years. I don't know when the last time. Uh, it was probably the year or two before the pandemic where we came before the board. Um, uh, it's sort of in recognition of, of filming select board meetings, and uh, we live stream them, which is one of the few events that we live stream. Um, and there's an average of 50 people watching you. Um, more when the pandemic first hit, um, and that's just the, the rough average of last year's select board. There's um, town meeting, obviously, and other uh, special meetings that a select board calls. Um, and uh, we have a board of seven, three of whom are appointed by institutions, uh, Ilsley Library, ACSD, and the select board, and Farhad is the board, select board's representative on our board. Um, so he can steer uh, questions, concerns, priorities from you guys to us. Uh, we meet monthly on the second Wednesday of the month. Um, it's always glad to have visitors. Um, but I figured if there were any questions you had for me, that might be the best way. I've got one that's related to the question I asked uh, Fred. Um, obviously, cable 
is uh, being fragmented. I assume that affects your largest source of funding. Right. We're always kind of monitoring and slightly worried about people cutting cable subscriptions. There are approximately 2,000 cable subscribers in Vermont, so that, that's where the bulk, or in Middlebury area, sorry. Um, that's where the bulk of our funding comes from. Um, we're a little sort of protected from national trends in that there aren't many uh, options for uh, internet access or TV otherwise. And Vermont and Middlebury in particular skews a little older. Um, so those customers are less likely to cut their subscriptions. But that is something we're concerned about, keeping an eye on and uh, other resources like subcontracting with Ilsley for the technology coordinator position does bring in other funding. Other questions of Kurt? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's a good question. Where are you going so first? those two presentations were part of your annual review of uh, several, usually between three and five nonprofit agencies. Um, uh, per your uh, health and human services um, appropriation policy. Uh, next up will be uh, Tri-Valley Transit, and they'll be coming next week. Um, if you have uh, a desire to uh, talk to any of your other uh, nonprofit agencies, no one has requested an increase for funding. That usually gets them on our radar screen for a visit. Um, so. Uh, no one else has been invited at this point, but if you'd like to invite another agency, let me know. Okay, thank you, Kathleen. We also need to look at uh, warning a public hearing to uh, review our draft budget. Um, and uh, we're looking at uh, Warning it for next Tuesday. Okay, so that uh, has been warned already by the board. Sorry for that uh, duplicate. Um, okay. It's been published. I was just warned. thinking that's a little bit tight. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the other thing is a review of the town meeting warning draft. And the first draft of uh, the 2024 town meeting warning including the town finance department's proposal to shift the town's property tax schedule from a three bill cycle to a two bill cycle. And did everybody read the, the, uh, the memo uh, from staff on the rationale for, for shifting uh, the, the, the billing cycle from three to two? It certainly seems to make sense. I didn't realize they dealt with so many inquiries and that they had to uh, reissue new invoices that that would seem to be quite confusing mm -hmm. on my uh, mm -hmm. it seems like we have tried to make this change a, the last at one, least two, once a couple maybe years ago twice in town meetings and the community has not supported it yeah. so <clears throat> i just think we should spend a little time to make sure we do a good presentation i i do agree but i don't we uh, our rationale for changing at the time was a little bit different. I think it had to do with uh, COVID. The, uh, was it COVID or was it the uh, the the downtown construction? I think we did change it. From that. We yeah. had the reappraisal uh, valuation. I thought we had it was the reappraisal, reappraisal, and then we had um, the year that we tried to change it. It was uh, for the cause of the downtown bridge construction yeah. project. Yeah. Um, that is exactly why I asked Nicholas to prepare this memo so that we would have close at hand our, our rationale. And I think he provides a convincing argument on it. Um, we did not clearly articulate the impact that it has on our um, disadvantaged folks that are least able to pay their taxes uh, causes them a great deal of anxiety to get a, a big tax bill before their homestead um, is recognized by the state I'm still concerned that the payments going to be higher if you're doing two installments right of course so I'm concerned about that if people are going to be comfortable or not well, it does point out that you can budget and they could come in and find out what's an estimation of their taxes and start 
making payments. And I, I think um, that's all they're getting if they haven't had their uh, homestead reduction applied, then, then they're just getting an estimate. So right. I don't know. I, when we did it previously, we did it for a, a, a one-time, one-off, and, and it was supported. Uh, this would be more of a permanent thing, and I do agree. We, I think we need to walk through the rationale, but it, uh, listening to the rationale, it seems silly that we bill before it's an accurate tax bill. <laughs> Uh, I, I just I find that maybe, baffling. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Maybe part of the uh, the conversation needs to be, um, like was mentioned in the memo, um, but I know the town offers people who are interested in a payment plan as well. In addition to a bill pay service through your banking institution, I know in the past, I'm assuming it's still the same, you could call Jackie and make arrangements to set and set up a payment plan. Uh, I know that adds a little bit more burden to that department, but if people are concerned about it, there are <coughs> options, and I think just making it clear what those options would be and the rationale. I feel like we, when we've talked about it in the past, we've talked a little bit about this homestead issue and that the town has not supported it. So I just I want to just make sure we do a good job in supporting yeah. the case and getting the community support. Well, we might even get an article in the Adi Indy to start the <coughs> discussion. Yeah. Um, That's a good idea. The, the, yeah. uh, our, I, I don't our, in, our very capable reporter, John Flowers, is in our audience uh, tonight. I figured John would be there. <laughs> if not, he watches it afterwards, so. So, John, we're looking for a little support on explaining this, and uh, we'll, we'll see how we what what issues come up. I, I do feel like it's a little easier; it'll be less work and more productive work for the fi our finance office to be working with people to develop a budget than to try to explain um, incorrect tax bills. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Um, productive work. So uh, are there any questions on that at this point? Uh, and, and just to note that uh, today we learned that the Middlebury Union High School Auditorium is available um, as proposed uh, in the morning. Um, they have their usual play rehearsals going on, but they will work uh, with us so that we can be there. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Okay. Next is uh, the Middlebury Diversity Report uh, by uh, Tabitha and Lisa. I think we're running a little bit early. They so are not. They're not in there yet. yet. Well, why don't we go on to the uh, uh, Richards here? Um, well, that will be a long. How long is your presentation, Richard? Uh, Fifteen minutes. Or less. Okay, let's start with you. And Howard's with you? Okay. Hello. Good evening, Howard. Hi, how's everyone? Thanks for adding this on the agenda for tonight. Um, so it was two years ago this month that the select board adopted a resolution for, to, for, for the town to commit to doing what we can to reduce the carbon emissions of municipal, uh, of operations by 80% by 2030. Um, Can you show the first slide for us? Sure. Okay. And then, you know, so I think given the weather we've seen in the last couple of weeks, I think we all are on the same page when it comes to the dire state that our climate is, is in right now and that it is essential that we do what we can to meet these goals. You know, every, every little bit helps. Um, so I won't get on my soapbox to, to promote that since I think the fact that you adopted the resolution is a testament to where you stand on this. Um, so I, I don't want to take too much time. I want to give Richard as much time as possible, but I do want to thank him for all the number crunching that he's been doing. He's our, he's our data guru. and. There's a lot of work that goes into this and in trying to maintain the baseline and where we are. 
<clears throat> as you'll see, maybe, and I'm, I don't want to take still too much of his thunder, but maybe we haven't made as much progress as we'd like to have made to this point, but we do have a lot of future prog projects um, that we think will help get us there by 2030. But um, so let me hand it over to Richard so he can give you the details of where things are at this point, and then he can answer your questions. Thank you. So hi, Mr. Chairman, Select Board. Um, I'm Richard Hopkins. I'm a member of the Middlebury Energy Committee. Um, three years ago, uh, we brought you the suggestion that you adopt the resolution that you did adopt. And in the um, run-up to that, uh, you all held our feet to the fire and you said, so really, is this practical? Can we do this? Is this doable? Um, several of you were here then, several of you were not uh, on the board at that time. And we did some, some further investigating and um, came up with three strategies which if we are able to follow them, we believed would enable us to get an 80% reduction in what was then 10 years. It's now eight years uh, away, our goal, our goal to. So the, the, th the three main strategies are decarbonize the electricity, electrify everything you can, and in the meantime, and as an important strategy, um, decrease use of fossil fuels wherever you can. Even if you can't yet tr uh, move from, from fossil fuels to electricity, you can at least reduce your use of fossil fuels. So those are the three sort of high-level strategies. Green Mountain Power is doing our job for us in terms of decarbonizing the electricity. Uh, over, the, over the time period that we've been working on this, the last three or four years, they have gone from a low-carbon supplier of electricity to an almost zero-carbon supplier of electricity. And you'll see that as we go through this. And we've also, as a town, increased how much locally generated solar, solar electricity we buy. Uh, and Kathleen recently gave me the, showed me how to find the, the information about what we're getting from the, uh, the Acorn Array in Bristol, which is being applied against water pump number three um, electricity use. Electrify everything, it means that strategy means that every time we have a piece of fossil fuel equipment that is reaching the end of its life, of its useful life, it needs to be replaced, we need to, if we possibly can, replace it with an electric equivalent because our electricity is so very low carbon. Every time we switch from fossil fuels to electricity, we are essentially going from significant uh, greenhouse gas emissions to zero, or very close to zero greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so th this, this is about vehicles and about <coughs> building heat. Those are, the par those are primary, primarily the, the, the two big categories. And there are, exist options, non-fossil fuel burning options for both of those. There, will, there are more options now than there were three years ago. And three years from now, there will be even more options available. And one of the challenges for you all and for us is to figure out when does it make sense to wait to make a conversion because the better equipment or cheaper equipment will be available two years or three years from now than are available now. And when does it make sense to move ahead now so to be early adopters and, and, uh, and actually make the, make the switch now? So you know, I have the next slide. Um, <coughs> I think my, what I, w I want to focus on that second bullet. If, like, if the electricity is really carbon free, as we believe it is, then saving electricity, although it saves you money, doesn't save you any greenhouse gas emissions. It doesn't matter how much electricity you use from a greenhouse gas point of view, if it is carbon free. You can use as much as you want, or as little as you want. So saving on electricity really doesn't get you very far. And I'll show you the data from, from the town that, that support that. The next slide, please. There are various things you can do in the meantime. We, uh, the, the, uh, the staff of the town have been, have been very, very positive about using biodiesel when they can in place of regular fossil fuel diesel. This is 
uh, fuel that is 20% biodiesel and 80% fossil fuel diesel, but it's an improvement over uh, over pure fossil fuel. Um, weatherizing, adjusting thermostats. There's an opportunity with the wastewater treatment plant to replace fossil fuels with the output of the anaerobic digester. We'll be talking to the infrastructure committee next week in some detail about our analysis of, of, of that opportunity. And then uh, also related to the wastewater treatment plant is if in future we switch to a process that doesn't use lime as, as a drying agent and, and heating agent, then we can save a great deal on greenhouse gas emissions. Lime is manufacturing lime from limestone or from lime from carbonate rock releases a great deal of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And so we had we actually didn't appreciate that until a few months ago. So we're 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 readjusting our thinking about this. The next slide. What I'm going to be talking to you about, the data all come from the from the Treasurer's office. You just, it's just it's a matter of compiling information from the bills that we get for gasoline, diesel, natural gas, fuel oil, propane, electricity. Um, the treasurer's job, of course, is mostly to keep track of the money, and so it's just a little bit extra work for them to keep track of the amount of fuel purchased as well as the dollars, and they've, they've been very helpful in doing that with us. Um, and then we've if we know how many gallons of propane we use, there are known coefficients for how much CO2 does each gallon of propane release when you burn it. And th those, are, those are well known. Next slide. So this is the big picture. This is a four year, four data points, starting from 18, 19, 19, 20, 20, 21, 21, 22. Um, so next slide. The good news is that we've had a 45% reduction in estimated releases of carbon dioxide equivalents over the four-year period. So we're almost halfway to the goal with very little effort on our part. And this is what I predicted when I talked to you all four years ago, that Green Mountain Power would continue to make their electricity more and more carbon-free. And we would benefit when do, in doing this analysis and tracking our progress, we would see that. And that's what we see here. The bad news is that all of that reduction so far is attributable to that lower carbon GMP electricity. We need to reduce a lot more to get to 80%. And the longer we wait, the steeper we're going to have to make the, 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 the steeper the, the, the hill that we'll have to climb to get there. Next slide, if I may. So this, um, this is, uh, Estimated greenhouse gas releases in tons by fuel type and by year from our operations. So the, the big blue uh, section of the bar is the electricity. And it has gone down dramatically because Green Mountain Power has gotten even more carbon out of their electricity. The other uh, fuels, like natural gas, fuel oil and propane, diesel and gasoline, ha are essentially unchanged over the four year period. The next slide shows you those four liquid fuels um, with, the with the electricity removed. And there's some year-to-year -year variation, but basically we're looking at a flat pattern over the four years for those fuels. Next slide. So this is, this is a 10-year a or 12-year perspective here that Blue line on the left you saw before in one of the earlier slides, and the asterisk in the lower right is where we're trying to get to. The next slide. So this is this, those green bars are one way to get there. If we reduce our, our uh, greenhouse gas production by 13% each year compared to the previous year, we will, after eight years, get to our goal. I mean, nothing in real life is that smooth. But that's, but that's just to show you that of what a what a, such a, a trajectory might look like. It might go faster in the earlier years and slower in the later years or vice versa, but that's <coughs> what it would look like. Next slide. So we can't reduce our greenhouse gas emissions from the town's operations very much from reducing electricity use because it's already almost at zero. In fact, what we really need to be doing 
is increasing our electricity use of this very low carbon electricity that we have uh, as we transition from propane or fuel oil or gasoline or diesel to electricity. So our electric bills will actually go up if we follow this strategy, while our bills for fuel oil and propane and natural gas go down. Okay, the next slide. So here's, I mean, just, just to reiterate, you know, you tell them what you're gonna tell them and then you tell them and then you tell them what you told them. Um, and this is what I told you, <laughs> that we, we need to decarbonize the electricity, which is in progress. We need to replace fossil fuel equipment with electric equivalents wherever we can. And we need to uh, continue to invest in efficiency and conservation uh, where we can't yet transition to, uh, to electrical equivalents. So I think that's it. L last slide, I think. One more? Questions? Yeah, yeah so this is, this is just to bring us back to, our, to the resolution that you all passed three years ago. Um, at the time, I was proposing that we try to do this in eight years by, by uh, 2028. And people said, well, why eight years? And I said, well, because that year I will turn 80. And I, there's a good chance I'll live that long. But I don't know about beyond that. So, you know, 2030 is pushing it in terms of my lifespan. <laughs> um, I really hope that, that, that we can make, I want to live to see us meet that goal. And I also want to, I want to thank Laura for uh, setting the stage for us tonight. Um, you know, you all have, have, you all make lots and lots of decisions on behalf of the citizens of the town. And you consider lots of things. You know, and, and you have to balance competing uses of the funds. And you're volunteers, just like us. You know, and you're trying to do a responsible job. You know, what, what we're, we're, we don't have a specific ask here. We're not asking you to adopt a, a position or take a particular decision today. We just want to reemphasize the importance of considering this transition to low carbon fuels every time you make, every time you make decisions in a broad range of, of domains. So thank you. I'm open for questions. I'm not any, sure how it is. Any questions of Richard? Yeah, so um, I appreciate the 20% uh, biodiesel, but I think that's going to be one of our stickiest wickets mm -hmm. is uh, we've got a lot of heavy vehicles right. which use a lot of diesel. There's no electric alternatives. Yeah, at this point, uh, there's no early adoption option uh, there. And it looks like mm -hmm. our diesel usage would be equal to roughly our entire energy usage in eight years. If we Today's don't. diesel usage. No, there are, there are technical limitations to using 20% biodiesel, and we have an expert in the audience, and maybe more than one, uh, on, on doing this. The, the, fuel does, and the fuel often doesn't do well in very cold temperatures. Sure. Um, and so, you no, know, it's, a, it's a spring, summer, fall uh, uh, alternative at best. Um, you know, newer diesel vehicles, newer diesel vehicles run better on biodiesel than old v diesel vehicles did. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so there, there's technical progress in those areas as well. And I don't think we should write off the possibility of, of uh, availability of electric heavy equipment. There, you know, there are manufacturers, niche manufacturers that are starting to come out with such vehicles and. Two or three years from now, you may be surprised at how much is on the market. Yeah. When you see the progress that's been made to this point, and, you know, it only accelerates if you go with Moore's Law and sure. like that and in, in a few years. Well, and it, it, it may not be electric, too. It may be alterna other alternative no. fuels, but uh, there's a lot of work being done on it at present. And you know, we have eight more years, so stick with us, Richard. Well, you will hear from me again. I, I plan to come again to, see, to show this to you all a year from now and two years from now, Excellent. as long as I can. And that is part of the resolution adopting it was for us to come each year to yeah. give you a Good. progress report. Now it's hard stuff. Yeah. Well, we appreciate it. And it does look encouraging that even if it was GMP that brought a lot of those cuts to us, uh, we'll keep, I mean, we have in the last few years uh, shifted a number of our lighter vehicles. Uh, and uh, this year we, we 
uh, didn't do that for uh, several reasons, uh, primarily uh, availability and, and uh, trying to balance dependability uh, as they start working on it. But it's, as, you, as we recognize, it's still early in, in the process of uh, electrification of these vehicles. So. And I think we'd like to come back in the near future with some proposals for things that we could do as a as a town to help get us there. Okay. This isn't the the presentation to do that. So. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. thanks. Thanks for listening. We do, we do have a hand. We have a hand up. Okay. Mm. Hi, Judy. Yeah. So my question is, Richard, to what degree does local um, airport or airplane traffic affect local greenhouse gas emissions? Because from whatever I, I am seeing, it's considerably more than like running your car from point A to point B. And so the idea of increasing, even <coughs> considering um, increasing local air traffic to Middlebury Municipal Airport is not in line with what you're saying. Can you speak to that? Uh, there, thank you, Judy. Um, it's important. Um, this presentation is just about the greenhouse gases that are produced by the operations of the town of Middlebury, the library, the police department, the fire department, the water department, the sewer department. Yeah. That, that's, that's the focus of the presentation that I just made. It certainly is true that aircraft are significant contributors to greenhouse gases, um, both the small kind of, most small airplanes like at the uh, Middlebury Airport and commercial aircraft. And should we not be considering that? Sure, I mean, it's, impo it's an important, but it not, it's, it's not relevant to this particular analysis unless the town is in considering buying an airplane. If the town was to buy an airplane um, or a helicopter, then this no, would be this would be but, very much on, but on our mind. In minds. a more holistic approach to this, yep. would it not be wise to consider not only what the town of Finnbury specifically contributes, but what private enterprise mm -hmm. contributes, what private car owners contribute. Yeah, so in a... It's a broader, I'm looking for a broader assessment. Yes, and if you, putting on a different hat, I'm a member of the board of the Climate Economy Action Center of yes. Addison yes. County, CEAC, C-E-A-C, if you go to SEAC's website, CEACAC.org, SEACAC.org, and look for the greenhouse gas inventory for Addison County, you'll see an, an analysis that takes account of a much wider range of sources of greenhouse right. gases. And all I'm saying is, I think the Middlebury Select Board needs to take that into consideration. Okay. Thank you, Judy. Thank you, Richard. Good, thanks. Thank you, Richard. Yeah. And, and the rest of the Energy Committee. Yeah. 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 Howard and your entire committee. Um, are they with us now? They, they are not. Uh, they being Tabitha and Lisa. Um, I did see, uh, looking back at my correspondence with Tabitha, she's recovering from a surgery, so perhaps she was unable to attend tonight. Okay. If, if they aren't able to attend, we'll, we'll reschedule it. Yeah. Um, 
And it would be good for Lindsay to be here uh, as yeah. well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So maybe it's uh, the right way to go. So Chief, uh, Chief, there you are. We're ready for you, Chief. We're, we're a little bit. We're a little ahead of uh, schedule because uh, I think we've slipped one of our major, major events. Okay, I'm just coming from another meeting, so pushing around. Hmm. You didn't see me waving to you while you were driving the zamboni tonight. No, it's got to focus <laughs> like a laser. <laughs> you can't be waving at the crowd. I was jealous. <laughs> Chief is driving a zamboni. Yeah. yeah. I really? should have taken a picture so I could have shared it all. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Okay. Noise ordinance. Um, we had made some, uh, I think you probably have a copy of the latest version of it. Kind of cleaned it up a little bit, got rid of the unnecessary language, and just boiled down to what it is. Just an attempt to kind of keep things calm in the face of noise. And keeping it as simple as possible. I uh, try to stay away from... Uh, a lot of things which complicate this ordinance. Uh, we've followed the recommendation by making the quiet hours 10 p.m. on weekdays and 11 p.m. on weekends. Um, cleaned up some other minor la language things, like there was a comment here about authorized commercial trash holders, which kind of left the door open for unauthorized commercial trash holders to make noise anytime they wanted. So we cleaned that kind of language up. Uh, again, it's a civil ordinance. Uh, it's fairly simple and straightforward. Uh, the one questions that, that I did get, primarily from Fred and uh, a couple others, were activities permitted under public assemblages or other licenses. Like we added that word in there. That's really not something this ordinance is going to do. That, if, if that is something the board elected to do, is to have some kind of licensing for a waiver on the provisions of the noise ordinance for activities. That's something the board would do outside the uh, ordinance, either as in a amendment to the public assemblage ordinance or other but this is strictly for if it's loud noise and the police go they check it out if they confirm it then it's a violation now i wasn't here for the uh, meeting when you reviewed it and sent it back with chief does this fulfill the board's requests on the, uh on that discussion Andy, I think I straightened out some of the language you yeah, sent you a did. question it, on. It reads much better now. Yeah. <laughs> That's the magic of cut and paste. Uh -huh. you, you, the bad language goes with it. <laughs> I have a quick question on Section 201. Yes. Uh, on, on Friday, Saturday, and special holidays, and it's a New Year's Eve and 4th of July, are those examples or just those two days? That's from the original ordinance, okay. and it's it's... I'm just wondering why just those two holidays, why not Memorial Day? That's a good question, primarily because there's noisy events that normally take place on those two holidays. Either fireworks, which sometimes are still going after 10 at night on a okay. weeknight. Um, New Year's Eve, obviously, we don't get the kind of noise that we used to get on New Year's Eve, probably yep. when this ordinance was written. Um, but I guess this, this leaves it open for the board to designate a special holiday for some event, such as the, the bridge opening here. Uh, with 12, 13 years ago, and some of the other events that happen that might be going late at night. So instead of special, can you say, for example, New Year's Eve and 4th of July? So. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, but that's not an issue for me. Again, we want this to be as straightforward as possible that somebody exactly. picking up knows what the parameters are. Ken, one of the concerns is the college has a big concern with the 11 o'clock. Is there some way that we can, is there some way right now that if the college, if we enact this ordinance, that the college could request a deviation from this and have an event this that goes to one in the morning? We would need to create right. such an event. That's what I was leading to. Or can it be put in here? I, I tried to keep that out of the the noise ordinance because I wanted to limit this to, to a noise ordinance of what the violation is. Right. Uh, it's like if you have a, a speed ordinance, it says if you go this fast, you're violating the speed ordinance, period, the end. doesn't make exceptions for police cars or things like that or emergency vehicles. That's somewhere else in the statute, that, that provision. So I think this is simply a matter of either amending the public assemblage ordinance to include 
a provision for that private assembly? Because a public assemblage <laughs> doesn't, the college doesn't have a public assemblage. Unless they do Unless it Unless the they street. use it in the middle of town. Uh, <laughs> yeah. If you read the ordinance, it, it, there really is, it is covered. It defines a public assemblage, but it also with, it defines a couple of other things in there that aren't really public assemblages. It's kind of, uh, again, it's a language issue with the, with the ordinance. You read it and, uh, you know, it gets into first, second, and third class permits. Um, it defines what a public ordinance is, public assemblage ordinance, but then it defines as you go through this um, a bunch of other things. Uh, this, this also includes restaurants and uh, oh. entertainment permits and things like that. Yeah. Yeah, so a second class permit does not include the public place right. uh, clause that the first right. class does. Yeah. This, so we could perhaps use that for private assemblage. This ordinance has grown over the years as issues come up and the ordinance gets amended to, to deal with those kind of issues. But this is probably the more appropriate place for that, uh, that kind of language. This is, this is the permitting ordinance, the, the conditional permitting ordinance. Oh, you're right. So the first class is in a public place in the second class. Well, you guys are reading that. I'm going to if Fred's got a question. Um, <coughs> what I was trying to do was okay. for, yeah. for Tom. I, I wrote an email to Tom. I didn't really write a select board. I think it was a packet. And what I was trying to do was to solve the problem that there's no authority for licensing. And reading this over on property or on no. public rights of way. Emergency vehicles. For very obscure. Oh, the public works. The town only has entertainment no permits up. for like two brothers, Mr. Ups and Waverly Inn, and it doesn't cover what you need to cover. And it's, it's, just take the parts that I tried to put in there to squarely give the college, you know, the authority to license the college for fair events out on a season or semester basis, license the festivals and business things, you know, for their event series and then deal with residential areas separately. They aren't betting the college against the residential neighborhoods in terms of this quiet hours thing. That was what I was trying to achieve. And um, uh, Tom, I talked with Tom this afternoon. He prefers to have some sort of separate future uh, ordinance uh, authorizing licensing. But this is all about noise, and that's the only thing you'd be doing it for. So I, I don't know. I don't understand separating the two. But uh, again, I'm trying to support Tom in this. And so whatever I put in your packet in there, it's not effective for the board to try to write an ordinance here. All right. So uh, I just want to apologize for any confusion by that being included in your packet. And, uh, I totally support Tom. I've worked with him for a lot of years. And I just wanted to try to explain the predicament we're in. We don't have any their authority for licensing. Public assemblage ordinance has, has these restrictions in it, even though our charter authority doesn't really restrict it as much as that ordinance does. Um, anyway, that's all I need to say. Is try to address what was in your packet. John? John Tenney. Uh, as a as a resident who's come to you before on this on this issue, I want to say first that I appreciate the work that's been done here. Uh, I think that uh, all, all of the effort uh, is good at focusing on the residential neighborhoods, uh, as is done in these ordinance amendments. Uh, the uh, uh, understand that, of course, there are two real parts to this. One is the first paragraph is really the whole essence of the order, uh, stating that it's out of order to, to create a disturbance which is troublesome to a neighborhood. And then it goes in the second part, in the 201, uh, specifically saying that a time, uh, a time exceeded for any activity would be out of bounds. But in fact, any time that the uh, disturbance is there, it's a matter of, of subjective enforcement. And in that subjective enforcement, the examples have been removed, but they were only examples. So really, I would 
hoped that the town would recognize that the uh, that the independent arbiter in fairness would say that the standard of the neighborhood is the norm of the neighborhood. The customary uh, customary atmosphere and life there, the customary operations and and, uh, and activities, and the things that are not in line with that should be complained about and should be controlled. Now, we look back in, in my neighborhood and as I've raised before, the, the good example of, of good citizenship has always been the Swift House Inn over many years, of holding many events and always keeping those events in, in check so that they are well attended, well enjoyed, and they're not a bother to the neighborhood. And certainly there's no reason why other things can't be done or should not be done. And I would hope that they would. But uh, we want to be mindful of protecting the, the neighborhood while allowing people to have a reasonable time. And I, I think that this, this, these changes and the, uh, the time limits uh, are certainly reasonable in residential neighborhoods, 10, 10 o'clock on weekdays, 11 o'clock on the weekends and the special holiday. Uh, that makes sense to me. So I would encourage you to adopt. Okay, and, and uh, I, th I think we've had this pointed out to us by Chief many times through our discussion of this, is that uh, it is subjective and it can be, he, he gets actually the majority of his aren't, aren't hours based, it's noise based complaints. And, uh, and, and, and that yeah, and so I think they're very familiar with being the, 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 the honest broker in those cases and, mm -hmm. and uh, resolving that uh, within the neighborhoods and I, th I think our police uh, department does a really nice job of that so um, are you comfortable with uh, the ability to uh, handle the few events at the college um, I do not know why they couldn't apply for a class two assemblage permit that would be yeah. an event as specified here for exemption is that that's under exemptions in paragraph B, isn't it? Yes. Uh, not under the purview of town shall also be exempt as for event licenses. So isn't that what we're saying? That it, this, this adds event licenses as a possible other category of licensed event beyond right. the existing right. public assemblage license. I was groping for the correct language in that part. <laughs> I, I, trying to point out this, this was the issue. That <coughs> there may be some other things that uh, the select board needs to do to fulfill that end of it. Okay, I agree with it if that's it. So, uh, on, on, uh, just one other quick question under emergency vehicles operated by fire, police, and rescue agencies and public works or public utility vehicles when used during snow operations or emergency repairs. So, if, uh, a house fire or a police chase, is, yeah. you could, there's problems there. <laughs> No, those are exemptions. No, okay, those I, are I, think, exemptions. I think the way that we were both reading it, is, am I wrong? fire and police are separate. Public works is, there a is, is for the removal of snow or repairs. Okay, okay. There, all right, maybe a comma there. Right? Yeah. You got that. I, I, I think it's it fine. Just a reason I, was, I was reading as one sentence. Right? You didn't see Bill Cornyn's uh, edit. That's what he said. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the, the late unpleasantness, there was some noise going on it's throughout all the night. Yes. Yes, there was trying to trying to keep power going and things. That was like so that. pleasant noise. <laughs> we listened for it all night long. Fred, I just you know the, you're taking a public assemblage ordinance that was written in the '60s for protests against the war uh, back then. I'm trying to do things with it that are challenging. I mean, at, at the foundation of this ordinance, it only applies to things on a public place. Section 101, public place is defined. And then the class of permits doesn't supersede that. So, you know, whether you really do it now or at some point in the future, give, just write a sentence in that says, gives yourself the authority in regards to license the college events on the college campus, the institutional zone on the college campus. Pick some easily definable place. Uh, just do it squarely and not have people look at, try to guess what's under the police's purview 
right now or not. Yeah. You know, I just, it's just a, a I think way. Point, point taken. Uh, and uh, just out of curiosity, is that a fact that that was written uh, for Vietnam War uh, protesters? Uh, the, the era that was enacted. Okay. All right. All right. Interesting. Are there any uh, other comments or questions on this? I think Heather said that at our last meeting, taking note of different noise ordinance, um, like all the tickets that we're handing out or the houses that we're going to, what's our procedure for like following up, tracking that, seeing if there's repeat offenders, seeing the outcome? Do we do anything? Yeah, it's a matter of record. Okay. It, it's all recorded at the police station. I'd love to keep note of this. Like, once, if the noise ordinance passes, what the outcomes are, where we're seeing it, if there's repeat complaints coming from certain households and from certain people. What has helped us is the, the nuisance ordinance. Mm. Uh, we had a troubled residence over here on uh, Cross Street. The owner of the house lives in Massachusetts and was very interested to making sure that there wouldn't be any further problems there. And she interceded and took care of that. And that problem has pretty much gone away. And we've had, over the years, a number of properties where we've had the same things. This is a new one, the ones uh, on, uh, uh, that we have here on North Pleasant Street, uh, but Weber Street and some of the other places that we've, we've had meetings with the landlords who uh, expressed an interest in taking care of the problem. Some just sold and get out of the business altogether. Others uh, were more uh, proactive in reducing problems. Yeah, it'll allow us to let data kind of drive further decisions, seeing if we really do need to rewrite a, another policy and pass something later on, or if this kind of covers everything that we're doing. We have a policy on, on the noise ordinance. Uh, obviously, the more complaints we get in a single space, the, the in a single time, in a short period of time, the tolerance for those kind of things go down and the enforcement goes up. It's a one-time thing. You tell them to quiet down, they quiet down, you're fine. You know, just they made noise and, uh, and it goes away. But uh, sometimes we have some hardcore cases where we have to do other things. But that's why we keep the record for our own follow-up. Do you actually write any tickets or it doesn't come to that? We haven't had since it's been the, um, uh, since we've had this a civil ordinance last year. So, but as I said, we've already got arrangements for restorative justice and some of the less hardcore cases to go through uh, restorative justice. If not, they just go to court. So if uh, there's no more comments. Uh, we have a couple of hands raised. We do, okay. Kevin McGrath. Hello there. Uh, Kevin McGrath, 51 North Pleasant Street. Hi, I Kevin. Just, uh, I ask that you both to turn back the Friday and Saturday night noise violation timeline by a few hours. You know, the existing weekend noise ordinance at 1 a.m., it, it's almost like it's a no noise ordinance at all, it seems mm -hmm. like. I know I couldn't believe it when I first started reading about this in order to try to, to, try to uh, research the relevant town ordinances. But rolling back the timeline to 11 p.m., I think it sends the right message that noise and disruption are taken seriously. And the 1 a.m. timeline is simply an enabler, not a deterrent. It's, to me, it's no coincidence that the college parties that I have to endure break up between 12.30 and 1 a.m. And the 12.30 and 1 a.m. time is kind of the worst of it. And the wee hours of the morning ending in a crescendo and cloaked in darkness except for the immediate neighbors like myself. So rolling the timeline back will no doubt bring back some level of civility to the neighborhoods with a message that sort of makes sense. And I uh, thank you for uh, considering changing the uh, Friday, Saturday night uh, noise ordinance to 11 p.m. And thanks for taking my comments. You're welcome, Kevin. Thank you. We have a hand from Judy. Judy, you with us? Yes. Um, so what about a noise ordinance at, in East Meadowbury, along Schoolhouse Hill Road, um, 
Florida and drive. Same town. Yeah. I'm in the airport. What about you know, uh, a relief ordinance? Same town. It's the this same. First, that whole area. Yeah. This is it's this is for all I of Middlebury. <laughs> the ordinance that you uh, should have read in our packet is the ordinance that we're adopting for the entire town. It includes East Middlebury. So what's being done about the noise related to the airport in East Middlebury? I don't know, Judy. Everything seems to bring back to the airport with you tonight, so I, I don't Brian, know. Brian, it's going to come back again and again and again. Yeah, well, at some point, I'm tired of hearing it. Well, you might be tired of hearing it, but the question is going to keep coming up. <coughs> What's being done about the noise in East Middlebury related to the airport? What noise? Have... So how many um, times have you called and made a complaint about the airport to the police department Ever? so they can investigate it? There is no way at this point to make direct contact with the V-Trans at the airport. You didn't listen to There's my question. No to make contact. You didn't listen to my question. This noise ordinance... Okay. This noise ordinance is for the town of Middlebury and is is enforced by the Middlebury Police Department. So I'm asking yeah. how many times you've called the police department to make a complaint about noise at the airport. Our instructions were to call the train. Do you want us to call the local police? Let me know if that's the case, and we will call again and again and again. <laughs> All you have to do, Heather, is say that's what you need to do. I wasn't trying to say what you should or shouldn't do. I've asked how many times you've tried that as an option. That's not an option, because the Middlebury police do not have jurisdiction. And, so and, my, and my point, Judy, is we're working on a sound ordinance in areas that we have jurisdiction and trying to get business done, and you keep interrupting for stuff that is not applicable to our current discussion. And it's, it's, get, it's getting frustrating. Yeah, absolutely. And the questions have not been addressed. And I will wait till this comes on to the agenda. But the select board has not addressed these questions or concerns. And so I'm done. It's Thank all you. good. Good. I'll wait. Thank you. Uh, the pleasure of the board on this particular. Do we have to warn a public hearing again, or do we? This is we're good. Yeah. No, we're good. We can, okay. we can move I'll, on. I'll it. make the amendment that Farad suggested by yeah, putting the word for example. To, yeah. It's going to be so, the only change. I'll is move that, to is that better than identifying which holidays count? It just has two holidays but on it. Ones that are really after dark. I mean, they're the ones that. that no, uh, Memorial Day people can have parties at night. So what what stops from well, if we are if you are specifying two only two days? Groundhog Day. This I don't know. Ordinance what? covers it. Yeah. Then exempt every day. I think the intent was that those are the ones you typically mm -hmm. have fireworks. Right. Right. So. I'll make a motion to approve the proposed amendments to the ordinance for the regulation of noise. Second. Moved and seconded. Are there any comments on the motion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Okay. Thanks, Chief. Welcome. 
Thank you. So this will be subject to a final public hearing yes. uh, on those changes mm -hmm. uh, at your uh, January 24th meeting. Okay. So that was my question. Do, mm -hmm. do we need to warn another public? Do we need to make a motion to warn another public uh, hearing uh, or not? I'll, I'll, based on your motion now, I'll okay. take care of that. We're never gonna get to 11. Okay. And the last uh, item, uh, they didn't come on, right? Clarification: Did you just approve this? We approve we approved it. Here? Well, I, I I'm understanding now that it's got to go back before a final public hearing for final approval, uh, because we made changes to it. And so that would come up in the 24th. 24. Thank you. You're welcome, John. Uh, the, the uh, and they did not come on, right, uh, Tabitha? And they did not. Okay. <clears throat> so we will slide that officially to a future meeting. And uh, the next item is the airport master plan and the uh, upcoming close of the state public comments period. And so... Uh, the, the final, the master plan, uh, the master plan uh, presentation was given, and uh, the select board has had an opportunity to see the, that as well as um, I know at the last select board meeting there was a lot of airport comments, and so this is an opportunity for the board if there's something that you would like to make sure. Uh, that we haven't already we've already sent one letter is there anything that that the board would like to do differently uh, or add anything to that letter <clears throat> Ross thanks um, so it's been brought up a few times this evening, uh, the importance of our energy use in the climate situation. And if you look at the master plan, the latest draft that's on the website, um, is you know, one paragraph, two sentence uh, of addressing climate. And it basically glosses over it saying, you know, greenhouse gas emissions are estimated to be like one tenth of one percent or something. And that's all they say. Um, you might want to consider suggesting that the master plan plan for the future and how to address climate. And simple things like uh, trying to be sure that there are fuel services available for the alternative fuel airplanes that may be coming down the pipe, making even just car, electric vehicle stations for cars. None of that is even being apparently considered in the draft. Um, it seems to me that that's something the board could do that's, that's a little outside the focus that you've had so far of the municipality, but it's a way to help maybe start to move that needle in the wider community. It seems like a reasonable request. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's the first time we've heard that. That's it's the first time we've first heard time that. We've heard that. I yeah. brought it up at their meeting, but that was whenever that last meeting they had. It was here in this room. Yeah, I several weeks ago. I must ago. have slept through that part. Yeah. Could have been. <laughs> John? Uh, I'm here representing Sean Flynn. Yeah. And uh, Sean has an application in for a new multi unit hangar at the airport. Uh, I wanted, since there are questions raised at times of whether there is demand for uh, hangars and a, and a demand for uh, user opportunities at the airport, that in fact uh, uh, those, those demands are, are being represented by Sean's application for a five unit, 17,000 square foot uh, T hangar there at the south end of the airport, which will uh, involve a significant investment and allow uh, customers to participate as with spaces for their planes, and those, those spaces are in demand. Uh, I can also uh, speak for Sean, uh, having worked for him now for some time, that 
uh, Sean will endorse the uh, efforts to improve efficiencies, uh, climate control uh, measures, and so forth uh, to get the best efficiency and, and climate protection uh, possible. And with the application, we are also trying to bring a new water main down to the south end of the uh, uh, airport, which will also enhance fire protection for, for that and for other properties. And uh, so there are significant demands there. John, I had a question on that from a citizen today. And uh, I can see where that hangar is on the master plan. Is that where it's at right now? I could not find where an application, an actual uh, application has submit, been submitted by John, by Sean yet. The, the application is in limbo with, with town planning. Okay. Because of the inability to act on that application due to the master plan renewal process being okay. in the works. So we're, we're, we're hanging. <laughs> okay. No, that, that's kind of where I thought it was. And I just wanted to make sure I gave correct information. Yes, yes. And it, uh, it would be immediately south of the last T hangar that uh, exists to the south there, just on the other side of the access road there. Yeah, I saw it on the, on the uh, master plan design. For us. Yeah. And as I said, it's a, a five-unit uh, condominium uh, arrangement hangar. Uh, so five separate units in one one building, which is seventeen thousand square feet. Okay. Ross, would you have a uh, a sentence that we could request that would address your particular request? I did not come prepared with an example. For you. I'm sorry to say. Uh, this well, we're talking. If you could think of one that we could consider. Well, also, construction uh, at the uh, at the airport is not only dependent upon this master plan, but on Act 250 review and approval. Mm -hmm. Of course, Act 250 has that provision built right into its criteria, so that might be the place to deal with that as well. Although I did happen to notice today, H2, a bill is uh, looks like it's going to be introduced this session in the legislature. It actually removes all hangar development at airports from Act 250 oversight. That's what the bill says. Now, I don't know if it's going to get any traction to go through, but that may be coming. At least that's what one of these one bills <coughs> News to me, and I don't know why. Yeah. Brian. Yeah. Um, I just got a comment from our viewers at home that uh, folks not using the microphones, no matter how clearly and loudly they're trying to speak, are not intelligible. Okay. So she gets my goat, but uh, this would be the time where Judy could bring that particular concern that she has up because it has to do more with the airport and uh, that that uh, would be a reasonable request. I will tell you that we've had a number of complaints and we've given them several different ways to address noise issues. I think it, if we're asking for something, a clear line of communication for when there is an issue is probably is probably a reasonable request for the town because uh, it does it does get frustrating. I mean, I used to deal with a lot of them before I was even on the select board uh, because people knew that I had a connection with the guard, and it happens to be a lot of the issues are with the guard, and uh, they can be addressed. Uh, they do it typically out of out of uh, trying to be good neighbors when they're training down there. But uh, we don't have, you know, we clearly do not have authority over their maneuvers, and Judy neither also, does the state. But the state had knows when they're in there. Judy also had concerns about other areas that she was talking about, not just the airport. She was talking about East Middlebury, Schoolhouse Hill Road. Well, she took it right to the airport, so. Yeah. Um, so she does have her hand up. If the, just let me know when the good time is for her, if any. I don't. Uh, yes. Um, come come forward. Uh, Sorry. Which one? 
Uh, Anyone? Okay. Yeah, Doug Gurney. Um, I'm just wondering, she was not specific at all about her complaints about noise at the airport. There's no lights out there. There's no operations at night unless it's the guard training. I, I'm guessing it's the guard. It, it could be. She needs to be more specific about that so that before it could be addressed with chief. It's just a random thought. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Doug. The other thing I think just, you know, clear a clear line of making a complaint, I don't think, I think what residents are looking for is resolution to what they consider the problem. Mm -hmm. And just being able to make a complaint doesn't, you know, like it's more about mm -hmm. getting a response yeah. to the complaint as well, I think. So I think if we put something in writing, needs to be a little more specific. And I think with a timely manner, like I think a lot of the complaints were, I got a response. After five it, months. Yeah, after a really long time, ahead of a meeting, yep. out of like good PR, instead of yeah. genuine willingness to collaborate. And, and I think that's where the, the, you know, if it's the guard that's, they have the right to yeah. do it and, and they are, but they tend to be, if you, if you use the right channels, they, they tend to be re reasonable about moving their operation if you're interfering with something. But they, you know, that's one of the reasons why they use the Middlebury Airport is because it's dark. <laughs> uh, and so, Laura. I was on public health and safety when we were talking about the process for um, reporting noise complaints. So I do remember Judy's point about being directed to VTRANS. And then the other part of that was that they were supposed to produce a report that would be given to Middlebury Police so that we could we could track the data. Mm -hmm. um, and and there was no easy way to enforce that, like how to trigger that. But maybe there's something you could put in here that says that um, a quarterly report on noise complaints should be delivered to the town of Middlebury Police Department. Something like that, you know, as your language. And then I do agree with Ross's point about provisions for the electrification of everything, you know. Um, and I do hope that small flight will go that way. Um, it makes me sick, you know, like actually to see air um, jet carbon emissions continuing in the direction that they're going. It just is the wrong direction. Um, and I don't know where that technology is going. I hope it goes in that direction. And that will be quieter. Mm. Those tiny drones are pretty loud. That's true. I don't know if uh, <laughs> electric planes are going to be an um, awful well, lot quieter. Okay, maybe not. <laughs> I um, haven't heard one of the electric uh, helicopters. Uh, but I just think, yeah. you know, look at the, look at how successful the rail um, use has become mm -hmm. in Middlebury. And the energy that's required to move that versus get something heavy up in the air is just so significantly different. And we just have to think about that. You know, and I know it's out of your purview, but it's certainly something that I think we all should be thinking about, you know, in terms of the future of, of airports, yes. any airports. Why don't you come forward, Russ? Uh, yeah, hi, Ross Conrad. Uh, you requested a proposed wording. Uh, Correct. So I came up with a sentence. Um, basically says, all future airport development should strongly consider and plan for infrastructure that will meet the needs of non-fossil fuel aircraft and ground vehicles and building uh, and building and hangar designs should meet the latest building energy efficiency standards. Something to that effect. I can get behind that. Board? Board okay with that? Yeah. Okay. So are we consider doing are we considering doing another letter? I think refreshing our letter. Yeah. I I would like to there's 
uh, I'd like to get some visibility on the fact that our set, that our reporting is still not going smooth, and and, and then uh, I think Ross brought up a topic that has been near and dear to our community, and and it doesn't hurt to make a point that that ought to be in any master plan. Um, I thought Laura's suggestion of a quarterly report and mm -hmm. if if the state felt that quarterly initially was too challenging to meet maybe even a semi-annual report um, request um, sharing with us um, noise complaint or and I or think any all complaint. complaints mm -hmm. yeah. Any. Yeah. Absolutely. complaints I think semi-annually is yeah. probably a cadence we can keep up with um, just, um, I think I would like to see that added. Mm -hmm. I think I would like to see that added if we're if we're going to send another letter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And okay. maybe thank you, Ross. Should I email this to yeah. Kathleen? Yeah. That'd be okay. great. Not only a report of the complaints, but the suggested resolutions. Mm -hmm. You know what. If there is something, resolutions. John, uh, can you to, can you come forward, John? We're getting complaints from the listening audience. <laughs> Thank you. No objection to what Ross said. Just to uh, make you aware that uh, the hangar buildings and all other construction at the airport is subject to the Vermont. Uh, commercial building energy codes uh, just as everything's been done in your buildings and so forth and so there are standards of construction insulation air tightness uh, uh, fossil fuel usage in different heating systems so there is a there is a lot of oversight there and those those have uh, grown in uh, stature over the uh, uh, last uh, 10 years uh, quite a bit so they are responding well to the demands here. Okay, so the, the hangars are, are probably already being um, watched for those types of, of conditions, but... Uh, the ones that I'm working on, yes. Yes. Those individual hangars, yeah. uh, some legislatures, legislators in their wisdom exempted those from building codes. You'll have to ask them why they did. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> we have uh, one hand up in the audience. Uh, okay. Hi, Andrew. Andrew, are you with us? Uh, hopefully. Can you hear me? We can hear you. I can hardly hear you, but I'll press on. Uh, thank you for letting me uh, have some comments here. I just wanted to make uh, just a couple, I think it's a question and a comment. Um, back in April, I think, um, I think it was you, Brian, that committed to, once the master plan was uh, in final form, which I think it is close to being final form, there's obviously another iteration, that you promised that there would be a debate or a presentation directly to the select board. Um, and I wanted to know if that was a commitment that uh, will be fulfilled. I know, I think given the comments and the, the time spent on this, I think there's definitely uh, a, uh, an opportunity to debate the pros and cons of the airport for the, from the point of view of the town of, of, uh, of Middlebury, not from the point of view of the uh, of B-Trans. The two public meetings that have taken place have been presentations from the point of view of VTRANS and from their consultants. And I think um, the commitment back in April, I thought, was a slightly different take, uh, which was that uh, VTRANS would come to the select board and present the plan and be open to debate um, uh, the, the pros and cons of, of the uh, wider questions beyond even the master plan, I think. So that was the one whether, uh, maybe I'll, I'll stop there and that. And, uh, and see if, if Brian wants to respond to that. Yeah, I, I, I guess I feel like we have been debating this airport all year, um, and <laughs> I, I don't know how much energy I got left to, to expend 
on debating the pros and cons of the airport, given that we have limited control over it, um, Andy and I, and uh, you know, there's there's people coming down on both sides, and I, we've got real issues that we're really trying to address: housing for for families, child care, and and my energy is is I'm, I'm just running out of energy, I, you know. With, and I'm getting, I'm, I'm getting to the point where I feel like we've gotten a number of concessions, and where, where do we stop for one or one or two people? And, and so, uh, I, I'm, I don't know where I'm at on that, Andy. I, 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 you know, you had a huge issue, and I, we gained the concession, a, a real major concession. I feel like for you, if you care to, to take that concession, and. Uh, so I, I, I'm, I'm ready to turn the corner and, and work on some issues that impact a lot of people and impact the future of our community more than what the airport does. That's where I'm at. <clears throat> Are you there? Yeah, I hear you. Oh, sorry, I didn't know I was still on. Uh, that's that's fine, Brian. Um, uh, well, on that on the concessions, the you uh, the select board did um, did write the letter, and I think there were four points in that: the environmental, looking for environmental safeguards, uh, talking about the water source, um, uh, amend the hangar footprints, which I think you were just referring to to take account of residential properties. I think the third one was the airport road improvements, and I think the fourth one was better communication with neighbors as the planning process, as this planning process concludes, but also as the uh, as, as others may begin. And I, I don't know whether, uh, did you, did the select board receive a response to any or all of those? I, I would say that they've addressed at least for sure two of those and uh, are working, yes, at least three of those. I mean, the, the communication process has been changed, the hangar footprint has been changed, and they're certainly committed to the environmental. Uh, I, I forget what that fourth one was. But a, uh, improvement, oh, to the road. Airport road. improvement to the airport road had a trigger in it and uh, is, is not something that is, is, uh, is in the immediate plan. It's something that comes down as, as if at some future point the traffic count moves up on airport road. Okay. Uh, did they... Is that part of the public uh, record, the, the responses to those? <laughs> I know, you, no, it's probably not, because I know like some, one of them is, is direct to you, Andy. So, uh, well, I, I don't appreciate I, I this. I actually haven't heard anything that's, specifically. That, that's we can not talk, right. We can talk offline on that. But, yeah. Um, um, I, I guess my final point is just that the concerns are often not are not asymmetric. That's one thing I've learned um, through this whole process. And what I mean by that is that uh, uh, to some people, the airport uh, is a place to have recreational flying, a hobby, and uh, and the concern mainly there is certainly around hangars is to be able to protect their expensive uh, aircraft from 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 the winter from the toils of the winter in Vermont. Whereas for others, uh, for other residences, for residential homeowners, um, the concerns are a lot deeper and I think more meaningful in the sense that they uh, they go to quality of life, to the environment, to the noise, to the pollution. And one comment on the pollution aspect of it is that, uh, uh, and Ross shared, uh, Ross had shared this with the group of us that uh, that, uh, uh, that the the single biggest source of lead in the environment is from un, is from leaded fuel used still used um, by aircraft that fly uh, across homes and across schools and across 
Wanderers and particularly in and around East, East Middlebury. So those are different scales and uh, I don't think they're equivalents to, uh, uh, to some of the other non-residential concerns about the airport. So um, I just want to put that on the record that uh, the concerns about the airport are not, asymmet are, are not symmetrical. So you can't equivocate the, uh, uh, the concerns of the residents from the, uh, from the concerns of the users, I believe. And I, I, think the town, I think the town, I guess my final point on that is the town should take that into consideration in any letter it writes that the, uh, um, uh, of, of, the, of, 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 the, of the substantial concerns of its residents. Okay, I'm not. <clears throat> yeah, I, I guess I'm not sure. <laughs> that's that's brand new uh, discussion and and not something I'm in any way way prepared to uh, include in a letter. Andy, I mean, that, about discussion about lead. So, <clears throat> all right. Raised his hand again. What's that? Andy raised his hand again. He did? Mm -hmm. Oh, and Judy. No. But his see. hand was up when he was. I, I, I'm ready to, to move on. So, okay. do you guys want to hear from, from Judy Bye. on this? Okay. Do we have a, a, uh, um, a sentence that would be included on the noise and, and tracking of complaints at the airport. Um, I, I can work with um, request a semi-annual report on complaints okay. and proposed resolutions. Okay. Yeah. Get and that into a consistent form with the other points. Thank you, okay, and this would be an updated letter um, asking for the few additional things, right? Okay, is there anything else that anybody would like to include in our letter? No. Okay, then I guess I would look for a motion to authorize Kathleen to get a letter out for us. I'll move to authorize the town manager, town manager Kathleen Ramsey to draft an additional written letter from the select board to be submitted to WeTrans, further summarizing the position publicly, state, publicly statement by select board this evening. Second. Public. Moved and seconded. Comments on the motion? Hearing none, all in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Okay. Uh, check warrants has me. I'm not sure who's got it for tonight. I got it. You got you it. Got it. Okay. I, I move to, to approve total <laughs> expenditures in the amount of $280,303.10, consisting of $166,336.08 for accounts payable and $113,967.02 for payroll for the period of December 28th, 2022 through January 3rd, 2023. Second. Moved and seconded. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Okay. Board member concerns. Andy. Um, I'm good. One thing that came up uh, was a mention from Fred of AECDECAC. Uh, was he close? <laughs> <Was he> close? <laughs> uh, about the, uh, the plastics uh, plant, the yeah. folks trying to to uh, use the films for things. And I was wondering if we knew anything. You said they're working on that. getting funding. Right. Okay. That's good. I'm glad it's still in process. Okay. That's okay. my. <laughs> All right, Dan. I just a quick question, uh, Kathleen. Um, I remember last uh, 
select board meeting, we voted for a $26,000, I think, generator for the Halliday Road. Um, are we going to vote for a generator for the Helping Road all in? Did that fail? That failed during the... Okay. the Follow up on that. It, Dundon's was there pumping it out about every, about every two hours. And really? Yeah. Really? And that's a, and that's a relatively new one. And then, um, then a generator appeared uh, about 24 hours into it, next to it. I never heard it fire up, but... So we might have lost the $26,000 pump. So that was... Um, um, we're going to be, um, just a quick question, we're going to be uh, having a vote on a new town clerk. Have, have we had any, seen any interest of anybody? Is that something the select board could be helping to move along? There have been a, a few inquiries. Um, I don't believe anybody's submitted a petition at this point. Um, so if you, if you. Maybe once we have petitions, we could bring them in and let them present themselves in front of the uh, in front of the uh, people that, that are watching. And okay. I think that'd be great. Give, that, give them an opportunity once, probably closer to election day, though. And, yeah. and I'm sure the Addison Independent will also do interviews. That's yeah, a that's learned. a big event. I'm just asking people, seeing if there's anybody that I know that might be interested. Yeah, have My them stop by no. and see him. <laughs> I think she said something stronger. Than <laughs> she did great. Okay, Isabel. I'm good. You're Thank good. You. Broad. I'm good. Thanks. Okay. Um, I just would like to publicly thank the the line workers mm -hmm. and um, road crews and police department and fire and all of all of the all of the all of these who um, put such a great effort in to the. Christmas weekend storm cleanup and working to be away from their families to get people back online. So just a big thank you out to them. Public Works Department. I don't know if you mentioned that part too. Yes. They, they, they're cheerful to talk to at really early in the morning <laughs> in 70 mile an hour winds. They were. They were. Guys were. They were great. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It was quite a. Whew, it was quite an event, wasn't it? Um, we have an executive session, Kathleen? We do not. We do not. Wow. Okay. I, are we going to have one uh, before? Is there, because I see there's stuff in the draft, um, the draft note of the draft town meeting notice. We'll, we'll be having one maybe next yeah. week? Or? Um, I may have binge come to it uh, okay. to discuss. Uh, All right, got it. Provide an update. Okay. Um, so, then. Uh, motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed? Thank you. We're more effective than the United States House of Representatives. <laughs>